I, I do believe that we all have some degree of an innate like instinct in believing in the supernatural. For me, I think of the universe in terms of the universe with a capital U. Um, I think there are these supernatural and paranormal wonders that are really just natural and they're part of the universe itself, the, the matrix of it. And it's just a matter of discovery. And paranormal just simply means the dictionary just means it's stuff that hasn't been discovered by science yet. So it's not to say a lot of times paranormal is outside the scientific world, but it's just things that we can't or haven't explained yet. In the 1990s, the supernatural TV show, The X-Files, captured the imagination of millions, and it popularized the phrase, I want to believe. For every skeptical Scully in the world, there is a Mulder who always wants to believe. And those believers are willing to accept a wide range of paranormal phenomena, from aliens and ghosts to ancient civilizations and even Bigfoot. A recent national poll found that over 71% of Americans believe in miracles. 42% of Americans believe that ghosts exist. 41% believe that extrasensory perception, telepathy, is possible. And 29% believe in astrology. But why is it that they want to believe? The seeking, I think, is a, a sort of mystical quest. So ghost hunters, um, cryptozoologists, ufologists, whatever it is, they are seeking something that is bigger than what conventional thinking tells us our reality is beyond our five senses. And science has teased this, right? That the world is so much bigger the universe is so much more magical and diverse than we may have imagined. But it seems to me that our imagination often drives the search for answers. We have to sort of imagine what could be before we can even seek it. And so the idea that we can imagine that there might be these elementals or spirits or ghosts. Minus the mannequin, how many people, human beings are in the room? <laughs> or chupacabras, or Bigfoot. That there might be extraterrestrials visiting our Earth from another planet. That fills us with a wonder that I think just sort of feeds the spirit of living. That it makes life exciting. And in the search for that, I think there is something almost spiritual about it. There is so many similarities even at a level of people who had an encounter of the fourth kind where they've met an alien or been abducted or been in close proximity have a lot of the same kind of traumatic effects to them that happens to people who've seen a bigfoot and there's crossovers where people report seeing orbs of light and then they see a bigfoot um, then there's people that see they see orbs of light and then they see ufos or they see these craft land and yeah there are kind of it's kind of you know, different chapters of the same book, if you will, you know, of the paranormal, of the, the fringe topic. Just the idea of, of an ET and to believe that that's an even possibility, your mind is already open. You're already sort of walking into this door to get knowledge, right? To be receptive. And when you're in that receptive state, it's it's an amazing place to be. And you're there's non-confrontational, everybody's eager to learn. And uh, what I like to share is like, and what, what I've learned from my journeys is self-empowerment tools. I don't buy into everything I see or hear, you know, with your mouth wide open and your eyes just bulging. I mean, that's, that's not gonna get us anywhere. I don't think, you know, just believing in everything you hear because it's a cool story. That's, that's not gonna help anyone. I have through my involvement with UFO research for the government and 
now I suppose as as somebody who writes and broadcasts on this, I interact with the UFO community. I, I have a good knowledge, I suppose, of of ufology, for want of a better word. I know that there are other mysteries, other fields of study. So we have, for example, all, all sorts of anomalous creatures seen all around the the world, monsters, and and um, I suppose most famously Bigfoot, say, and you have the whole cryptozoological community. I suspect there are similarities and differences between those communities. And it's great talking to people from UFO world because they talk about a lot of them anyway, multiple, you know, hundreds of different alien species and multiple planets and different dimensions. So when you talk to them about, you know, a hairy bipedal creature in the woods, they're just, it's not shocking to them where the average person, um, Bigfoot's a tough sell, but to them, they're kind of like, yeah, well, why wouldn't they exist? So they're actually very easy to talk to, very inquisitive. And a lot of the stuff that they talk about crosses over. A lot of the ancient alien stuff and historical encounters of UFOs and aliens. You know, was, was this person in history an alien? Did these people have help from alien technology and civilization? And you look back a lot of these same cultures and they talk about Bigfoot. And they talk about Dogman and certain chimeras and strange creatures that people still see today. So there, there, there's a lot of history and a lot of context there that's very important. The crossover between cryptids and extraterrestrials, UFOs, is that there's this meeting of the tangible and intangible. And I love that nexus where both of those worlds meet. I'm, I think I'm probably more passionate about Bigfoot than I'm about UFOs because well, first of all, I have a BS in anthropology, so you know it, it's something that I can justify my going to school for five years, you know, in one sense. But for whatever reason, that's captured my imagination a lot more than maybe UFOs. I mean, I'm passionate about UFOs just as well, but I'm a little disillusioned by the everything that's went on in the UFO field, you know. And there's a lot of people don't have the best interest of the field in mind, and that's you know that's really frustrating. The similarities at conferences where you've got big crowds and, you know, everybody's listening to the lectures and so on. I mean, that's pretty much the same, whether you're talking about UFOs or if it's cryptozoology. What I've found is that the lectures that are done in cryptozoology are far more visible in terms of pictures um, and imagery. You find that lectures and conferences uh, in relations like Bigfoot are far more picturesque, you know, location pictures, uh, pictures of the witnesses, um, you know, shots at the local lake where something's been seen, pictures of Bigfoot casts. So in other words, the imagery for the audience is huge. You tend to find very often with UFO lectures, it might be like two shots of the Roswell crash site, somebody presents a document, and there isn't really as much visual material as there is, you know, going out to, as I've done a lot of times, like Puerto Rico's El Yunque Rainforest looking for the um, Chupacabra. Um, I've done a lot of lectures where I've probably got 40 pictures of the places we went to, but you just don't get that with, you know, lectures on the Lotus UFO case. There might be a blob in the sky and a picture of the research appointed in the sky so that's a big difference as well but ultimately i think that both fields encourage us to say yes take a look behind the veil and see what's there that's exciting there's a buzz there and living in that mystery um, i think gives one a sense of connection to something bigger than themselves and because these fields are, for the most part, non-dogmatic, meaning unlike a religion or something, right? There, there are not a, a set of rules that someone says, you must abide by this, you must believe this. You can have that spiritual search through these mysteries without anybody saying, um, you're spiritual belief or your um, sense of wonder or your curiosity is 
inherently evil or wrong or bad. Uh, I find it really freeing. Bigfoot community tends to be a little more grounded. A lot of these guys are just guys that live out in the woods. It doesn't attract as many crazy people to, or let's say delusional, to be honest, you know, as the UFO field does. Even if we find out something is not true, that's okay. I'm glad that we went on this journey together. I'm glad to be a part of the, the community and the people out there who do this. Um, you know, it's for me, ultimately, it's all about peace and love and harmony and um, compassion and empathy and caring about each other. And the paranormal world is a playground that says you don't have to have all these boundaries that institutions or governments or your local culture or societies or history has said that you have to abide by. Sometimes you've just got to let go, go with the flow um, and enjoy. And um, for me, that's what the paranormal is. It's really just letting go and enjoying what discoveries or stories I might find along the way. Yeah, it's interesting because there, there is not much cultural crossover between the alien fans, the ancient alien fans, the conspiracy theorists about governments and, and stuff like that, the Bigfoot people, the ghost people. And there really should because basically we're all the same in the sense, if you put us all together, you'd have a really, really massive block of, of voters and political activists because we're all people that recognize in one way or another that the world that we're presented on TV is not reality, that there is a much deeper, maybe darker, but certainly more interesting reality that we exist in than what we're, we're sold every day. Over the years, absolutely, even presidents have seen UFOs and gone on the record to make statements. What they know, what they really know, of course, maybe is, is a different question. The only thing I could say to the 150,000 people who die every day is that their body will remain here. However, there is a distinct possibility that there is a continuation of consciousness. But even if there is survival after death in some form, that implies that we also had past lives. But the fact that I can't recall them, at least not consciously, makes it a moot point. I don't care if there's life after death, whether I have a faith-based belief in it or not. I, if I can't recall it, it does me no good. But nevertheless, I'm curious. Our understanding of time-space is expanding. Our understanding of the very structure of the nature of reality is almost getting looser and more interesting. It's expanding as well. And that means there are just perhaps infinite possibilities. And so if we imagine something to be real, if we imagine that we can traverse the cosmos and be at the another part of the galaxy within just a few minutes, if we can imagine that consciousness exists everywhere, almost simultaneously, if science teases that all these things are possible, that there are multiple dimensions, then of course, why couldn't there be cryptids walking side by side, living right amongst us, and we have no clue? That, that to me is fun. It's like, I, it's just fun. I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but it, it's fun. That makes life really interesting, and I don't need it to make life interesting for me to, to, to be happy or to be content. But it's like science, right? Uh, reading the latest news in science, um, the latest discovery. To me, that's fun. I love it. So um, that nexus where all those worlds meet is probably the most exciting thing. This subject, it, it may still be ridiculed in some places, but not in the circles where I move. Uh, there are plenty of politicians, um, military personnel, intelligence community officers who, who now say, yeah, absolutely, we take this seriously. We don't really know definitively what we're dealing with. What's really fascinating is in the last few years, the UFO people, I say that people who are into the 
ufologists, the people who are into UFOs and encounters and all that, or encounters, abductions, as they would say on their end of things, for the longest time, you know, they didn't look at Bigfoot people. The Bigfoot people looked at the UFO enthusiasts and thought, they're, you know, those guys are crazy kind of a thing. But in the last probably three or four years, it's really opened up and there's been a dialogue, and which is great. For me, that's one of the main reasons why I kind of like cryptozoology in many ways more than ufology, because I enjoy the sort of road trip expedition aspect of it, hitting the road and potentially, you know, staking out at a lake where something's been seen for seven days. You know, for me, that's more exciting than just pouring over something that's been released under the Freedom of Information Act from 50 years ago, which is really still cool material, but I kind of like that sort of hitting the road angle more than anything else. Yeah. It just comes down to the individual researchers. Like I think, you know, people get in their bubble and it's their focus and, and that's fine. But yeah, there is a lot of crossover in UFOs and Bigfoot, especially when you start talking about encounter stories or eyewitness reports in the UFO world. The same kind of descriptions, you can see it in their eyes, how traumatized they are, how it shattered their sense of being. Because, you know, Bigfoot's not supposed to exist. We tell everybody monsters don't exist and one's right in front of you. And the same thing with UFOs. Aliens aren't real. Then they see something, uh, an object in the sky perform something or do a landing or do a maneuver it couldn't normally do. Or they have some flash of light and a strange dream in the middle of the night that they're out of their house or something and a loss of time or the famous uh, Betty and Barney Hill one from the 60s where they, you know, lost time in the middle of the road and the highway. And it's just, there's a lot of similarities and they really are all connected. A lot of these people might regard themselves as I don't know, outsiders, crusaders for the truth in a situation where maybe they feel the deck is stacked against them, maybe from government, media, scientific community, whoever it might be. And that's one thing in my work I focused on in the last few years is talking, not just talking to cryptozoological researchers, and more importantly, not just Bigfoot people, but people who look at lake monsters and other strange creatures people see in the woods, talk to them and get their input. Then it branches out. Let's talk to the ghost hunters. Let's talk to the paranormal people. Life after death is an interesting issue because we don't have anything conclusive that says the survival hypothesis is real. We have strong evidential information from mediums who were studied at Winbridge, Winbridge Institute, whereby some people are capable of communicating accurate information from the deceased to relatives. In fact, over 80-85% accurate, so says the researchers that were published in scientific um, journals under well-controlled conditions. That is highly suggestive of life after death. Eleven years ago, I was a complete skeptic. And it wasn't until I met my wife, who had an interest in the paranormal, that I start to see things differently. She asked me to watch paranormal shows with her. And I could sit through about three minutes of it and say, this isn't real. This stuff isn't happening. This is for television only. But then one Valentine's Day, she asked me, she said, I want to do something different. I said, OK, what would you like to do? She said, I want to go ghost hunting. And I was like, oh, boy. Being a non-believer, um, I grew up, my father was a physics, chemistry, physical science teacher. And every question I asked my father about how things work or how does this happen, it was all scientific based. So the paranormal didn't really fall into the, any of those categories. Well, because it was Valentine's Day and that request I kind of needed to honor unless I wanted to pay for it until next Valentine's Day, I said, okay, we'll go. So I did some research online, found a specific hotel here in Phoenix that had a reputation for being haunted and booked the weekend. Thought I was done. Then I realized, wait, they're using equipment. She's gonna need something to investigate with. So bought her a night vision camera, digital recorder, and EMF meter. Thought, okay, now I'm done. Figured this equipment would sit in the closet for the next five years till eventually we threw it away. Well, we went on the weekend. And when we got back, I was absolutely amazed. She started going through the recording. She started going through the photographs. She started going through the video. And what she had captured, 
absolutely blew me away. What is your name? Uh, I can't really say I have seen anything else, but I've heard sounds of other things. Like no aliens, no Bigfoots. No, no I, have, I have seen UFOs. Okay. I've seen two. Um, I was actually driving, I don't know if it was Arizona or New Mexico, but I was driving down there 30 years ago. And I was so mesmerized by the stars because where I was at, I was in the middle of nowhere. And you can see everything. There's no ambient light. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. Go do that sometime. So I had an old 73 El Camino. So I got I sat on the hood and I was leaning back like this on the, on the windshield looking up. And I saw something going like this. And I thought, eh, probably a satellite. Because you can see satellites, you know, when you're out in the, in the uh, open air. And I'm watching it and it goes. I went, oh, <laughs> that was not a satellite. They do not go 90 degrees and gone. And uh, the other time, I was up in Northern California in the Redwood Forest, and we were doing a movie called Love in the Time of Monsters. And uh, we were out at a cabin in the middle of the night. And I wasn't in any of the scenes that were coming up for like an hour. So I walked away about 100 yards away and was looking up through the trees at, at the at the sky and the tree, you know, cause we were in the middle of nowhere there too. And boy, it was, boy, you can't, I wish I had a picture of the sky. Uh, by the way, if you try to take pictures of uh, stars at night, it's almost impossible. Um, but I'm watching, saw the same thing. <laughs> so both times I was watching it at 90 degree and gone. I was telling that to a friend of mine. Now, anybody out there that is into the UFOs and stuff, a friend of mine was Stanton Friedman. Now, Stanton Friedman was the guy who pretty much found out everything about Roswell. And I was so lucky. First off, I was on a, a radio show called uh, Coast to Coast AM. And this was the Halloween special from the Queen Mary many years ago. And I was back in the green room. And I, I will cherish this moment forever. Uh, first time I met Stanton. Now, Stanton had those big eyebrows, you know, and the glasses. And, and he's like a nuclear physicist. I mean, this guy's like a genius. And he sees my shirt and he goes... So, you believe in ghosts even though there's not a shred of empirical evidence? And he looks over his glasses at me, and I just smiled, and I went, huh, you believe in UFOs? And he looked at me for a second, he goes, touche. <laughs> so. And then you start talking, like I said, to paranormal people, then you talk to the ufologist, and you get their take on these other subjects. And you realize we're all, we're all kind of talking about the same thing. And there's so many similarities and there's so many crossover parts and in an area that has a lot of UFO encounters, like over military bases and things like that. You also get a lot of Bigfoot encounters, even out in the desert where it doesn't make sense. You know, guards, former guards, um, officers, MPs, civilian contractors, people who live in the area report Bigfoot in a desert around a military base. And it doesn't make any sense or this dogman creature that people see, they see them out in the desert around these military bases, but they also get a lot of these strange craft that fly over and, you know, like witness landing and all that kind of stuff. So it, there's, there's definitely something more going on. And uh, yeah, it's quite fascinating when you start making these connections and the little light bulbs pop up and you realize it's a, it's a great big strange world. I think by and large, most people um, especially in the paranormal community. I love the people in the paranormal community. Um, you know, it's just, just part of my tribe, uh, <laughs> as it were. And they're good people. And we are very supportive of each other. And I really appreciate that. And there's a lot of positive thinking. It, even five years ago, a UFO person, oh, those Bigfoot people, they're stuck up. They don't know, they're, they're you know, they're tracking something. You know, we don't really care about them. And then the Bigfoot people would be like, no, those guys are weird. You know, I spend my weekends out looking for a big hairy bipedal ape or something. But those those UFO people are weird. And because a lot of Bigfoot researchers and understandably so are very scientific, very hard fact. We want footprints. We want photographs. We want hair samples. We want DNA. We want sounds. We want actual tangible evidence. And UFO being a lot of sightings and encounters and hearsay, having even less physical evidence than UFO world, there was always a departure. I try and look at every case on its own merit, or its lack of merit even, and I look for the answers. And if the answers achieve something I'm looking into, that's great. 
If it turns out that the person who told me the story turned out to be a total fantasist and a hoaxer, you just have to accept that and realize that somebody took you in. And I think that's an important thing is you have to be balanced at all times. You don't need to be in the kind of Fox Mulder I want to believe scenario because that's not going to get you anywhere at all. It's just going to get you cool stories, but not answers. The negative is that yes, sometimes people can get obsessed and any kind of obsession is, is um, you know, damaging. And uh, unfortunately, I think sometimes there are researchers or individuals who need more out of life that, than what an interest in ufology or cryptozoology can provide. And maybe they begin to um, fill their investigations with hyperbole so that they can get more attention. Um, maybe they start to take an experience and a, embellish it um, too far, too much. And it's attention that they need. It does happen. So there, there is that negative uh, side to it. And sometimes, yeah, just like a religion or a philosophy of any kind, uh, they might be using that to fill some kind of void in their soul, in their heart, in their psyche. One of the things that I encounter on my YouTube channel and in my research and shows that I've been on is just because I talk about a theory doesn't necessarily mean that that's what I think is going on. I don't necessarily have to believe everything I hear. And obviously I don't just swallow and believe whatever evidence is you know, placed in front of me. But it's the conversation that I enjoy. I feel like any good... Um, researcher or teacher or somebody exploring a subject, you have to look at these things without that necessarily being what your opinion is. I always say, trust no one. And it's healthy, very, very healthy to be suspicious. We've all heard that line before, trust no one from the X-Files. But you have to ask, like, what does that really mean? Because if I have subscribed to the mainstream media, or if I subscribe to what I was taught in school, growing up and then I have this realization later on that what I've been told is not entirely the truth and I start discovering new information and I get that sense of, of betrayal then I'll start looking at other sources of information and those other sources of information may offer some truths but those truths can be mixed in with falsehoods and let's just say mainstream media or what you're taught in school, let's say there's an agenda there. If I look to some other source and they may be telling me some other truth that they weren't telling me, maybe I will believe that. But if they had agendas, how do I know this other person doesn't have an agenda? And we have to be really, really careful. So I think you have to look at all aspects of a conspiracy all aspects of evidence, whether it's cryptozoology and ufology, and try to be objective as you can. It's okay to entertain all these um, theories and explanations as to what the phenomena is, but whether it's a conspiracy like QAnon, or whether it's a government cover-up of the Roswell cr crash, if you believe all conspiracies, then none of them can be true. And so I just think it's healthy to step back, be objective, you know, enjoy the, 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 the prospect of discovering truth that has been hidden from us. I think that's very fun and exciting. You know, this is the double-sided coin to the paranormal shows that we were speaking about earlier. The one thing it did, which was fantastic, was open up the genre, get people interested in it, get people out of their house and actually doing their own research. That is the plus to it. The negative is that the show doesn't really teach how to do it, doesn't get into the depth of what to do, what not to do, and a lot of mistakes are being made today because of it. But, like I said, the plus is it's opened up the door. People will communicate about paranormal activity where 
40 years ago, you didn't touch the subject for fear of ridicule and all sorts of other negative reactions. Today, we don't deal with that as much. We can show posts, we can talk about it, discussions, there's show after show, whether it be online, live shows, paranormal shows, radio shows, TV shows. So the benefit to it was that those doors have been opened to further explore. Yeah, so for 10 or 13 years, I was a director of investigations from UFON Los Angeles, where my job was essentially to go out and investigate, you know, UFOs. And in that time period, I've I'm sure I investigated over 300 cases, you know, obviously a lot of them I was able to kind of debunk right off the bat, you know, but there's enough there that was really compelling, including we had a case in Pine Mountain, which is about an hour and a half from Los Angeles to two hours. It's a little community. And um, we had a case where uh, an object was seen flying above someone's house by different witnesses from different houses on two consecutive nights. Uh, they claim they landed in the forest and they saw occupants. And if it wasn't for the quality of, you know, of witnesses, I'd be a little skeptical because we're talking a pretty far out story, right? We're talking about occupants, but this just came from a former uh, correctional officer. And like I said, corroborated with a neighbor that saw it and independently. And not only that, but we walked to the forest and found the spot where it supposedly it landed. And there was this big round circular uh, mark uh, in the middle of this field that, you know, was hard to dismiss con considering the stories we just heard. Well, I, I will say the, the phenomenon in the last couple of years has been resoundingly positive, where a lot of people have come forward from the UFO world and they're genuinely interested. That wasn't always the case. I remember even five or six years ago talking to people that were into aliens about Bigfoot. And it, it's really funny how their arguments, and people are free to believe what they want, is that while there's the vastness of space, there's billions and trillions of stars with hundreds of trillions of planets and why wouldn't there be other life forms? Why wouldn't there be life forms in our own galaxy, in our own solar system, you know, beneath the ice on Titan or Mars one time was heavily populated, all the alien UFO theories, the backside of the moon, there's a base, all this kind of stuff. And they, and they just say purely from a scientific point of view, how could we have infinitely trillions amount of stars and planets and not have other life? It's just... Um, it's almost an overwhelmingly mathematical probability that there is intelligent life out there. And then when I say, but yeah, but Bigfoot doesn't exist. And I'm like, well, we're upright walking hominids. The fossil record has tens of many different species of upright walking hominids going all through the ages. And it's not, everybody thinks of evolution as like this, you know, this species came onto this species and this species. No, it was very divergent. There are very many off branches and offshoots of it. So, and then when I tell people Gigantopithecus was an ape that existed many um, hundreds of thousands of years ago that was eight or nine feet tall, might have been bipedal, might have been like a big orangutan, and there's many um, offshoots of the human family going back to Homo heidelbergensis and the Denovisians that were very muscular, heavy-built human beings that very well could have had hair on them and very well could be very similar to what Sasquatch. So, I mean, there's plenty of scientific reasoning or ex, um, explanation for Bigfoot. And there is also for alien life, for life on other planets. Science has proven there are alternate dimensions. So maybe some of these alien creatures are coming from a, are extra dimensional as, a, as opposed to extraterrestrial. Maybe they're a combination. They're using other dimensions to travel through space and time. Maybe they're lying to us about what they really are. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, you apply these same kind of critical thinking skills, which I'm a big proponent of, and apply it to some of these fringe topics, and it starts to make a lot of sense. And it's only this feeling of mankind has been everywhere, and we've seen everything, and we've done it all, and we've shot it all, and stuffed it and put it in a museum, and when we really haven't. Uh, one of the most exciting aspects of similarities between ufology and cryptozoology are associated events. Cattle mutilation. Often you see orbs, um, people have witnessed lights in the sky, UFOs associated with uh, cattle mutilation, uh, crop circles, and Bigfoot sightings as well, encrypted events. So what does that mean? If Bigfoot is nothing more than another ape family member in the hominid branch that has yet to be discovered, our cousin, you know, out there. 
I've heard a lot of good explanations as to why we haven't caught them on camera. But at some point you would think, why, why haven't we gotten enough evidence with the hair sampling and DNA testing to just outright prove that there's a brand new species? It's just part of the human condition to think we figured it all out. Everything is at my fingertips in Google. I've learned it all in school, especially for college educated. And especially when I talk, try to talk to Bigfoot about, um, I know a couple of either master's degree or PhD level wildlife researchers. They study bears and wolverines and stuff like that. I've got a couple in my family. And they entertain me talking about Bigfoot, but you can tell that, well, no, I've went to school for eight years and I've been doing this for 20 years and I've been out in the woods all these years. And I could tell you that they don't exist or it's completely improbable or I've never seen anything. And it's almost like as the education level goes up, the, the ego and the hubris goes up with it. But ultimately with all the, the cameras, no one has caught a Bigfoot really except for the patterson film so what what is bigfoot doing that keeps them so elusive of course we have tracks and that sort of thing i think i think there might be something else going on here yeah so i, I think it's really important to keep an open mind and understand science hasn't explained everything yet and use your critical thinking skills i know it it's you know getting a little bit out there but the more and more i think about it I, I feel like the idea that extraterrestrials as people suspect them to be are simply these physical nuts and bolts beings that are coming here um or that bigfoot is a physical being just living in the woods may not be entirely true uh it seems to me that bigfoot has the ability to slip in and out of detection far too easily for some mammal that's just yet to be caught on film. And with extraterrestrials, they too seem to have a will over physics or reality as we understand it and can manipulate uh, the world that we see with our five senses and slip in and out of that view as well. And because those two things are happening and we see events where they overlap, maybe, just maybe, um, these, are, these are beings that are beyond uh, just biological. If you look at it from more of a scientific hard fact, if you accept the possibility of alien life, if you then want to make the leap to people are seeing UFOs, and UFO means unidentified flying object, it just doesn't necessarily mean alien, it just means we don't know what it is. And if you take the other leap and want to go, and yeah, I believe aliens visit the Earth, I believe, you know, the crash at Roswell and the government cover up, and and you believe that, you know, on occasion, uh, you know, these alien species want to do abduct people for whatever reason, nefarious or good. They want to do experiments on us. They want to collect our DNA. They want to study us just like amazingly. Oh, why would aliens want to take people and study them? What do we do when we go study species as humans, as biologists? We tranquilize them. We tag them. We radio collar them. We take their height. We take their weight. We check their teeth. We check their claws and then we release them back in the wild. We do it every day with bears and mountain lions and coyotes and badgers and gorillas and chimpanzees and crocodiles and everything else. So it would make sense to me if I was an alien life form and I wanted to study earth for whatever reason and I was abducting people, what are these very large hairy people that hide out in the woods? Maybe I'm gonna abduct them too. So there's definitely a connection there. What it is, no one can definitively say. The other major difference between ufology and cryptozoology is the evidence. Cryptozoology doesn't have nearly as much supportive evidence compared to ufology. And I know that ruffles some feathers. Yes, there are uh, footprints. Yes, we have some sampling. Yes, um, we have some video, not really the best in general. But ufology has a rich history 
all the way back to the 1947 Nathan Twining memo, Lieutenant General Nathan Twining, openly in his report, speculating that craft witnessed by pilots and, and uh, military personnel could possibly be something that's off-world. And there's a rich history all the way through a numerous public and secretive projects. Well, in terms of um, my favorite evidence for UFO sightings is probably my own sighting which uh, I had as a kid. It was, uh, I was about, I was age 10. Yeah, I lived right here in Los Angeles and we were hanging out by the pool with my mom. And I believe it was a hairdresser was there at the time, you know? So I hang out by the pool, probably maybe eating something, getting some drinks, it was pretty late. Well, I wasn't drinking alcohol, was, you know, I was 10. But, but, and then all of a sudden we saw this big light that kind of came down and hovered above us, about 30 feet above our heads, above the pool. Uh, completely silent. Uh, about, you know, 30 foot across, about 30 foot up in the air, so about 30 by 30. And it stayed there silent, and then it kind of either blinked off or it took off. And all three of us saw it. And so after seeing something like that, even at age 10, and, you know, as you get older, you kind of go back and you're like, well, maybe I misunderstood what I saw it was a helicopter or whatever, but, you know, I still ask my mom once in a while. And to me, I just can't deny what I saw. So from that standpoint, that's by far the most believable, you know, UFO. Um, event. You get a little bit of pushback from some UFO people, but it's really gotten better in the last few years. At least from the people I've talked to, from the different chapters of MUFON, the people I've e emailed and talked with, people I've talked on the phone with and met in person. Um, and the same thing with the Bigfoot world, where I think 15, 20 years ago, it was purely scientific, show me prints, show me trackways, show me hair samples, show me raw footage, show me video, show me audio recordings, show me verifiable evidence. And that's always still important, just like in the UFO world, we want pictures, we want photographs. But when we start getting an eyewitness encounters and some of the odder things and that thousands of people all across the USA are having these encounters with Bigfoots and UFOs. And there's a lot of odd things, things of high strangeness that go along with them. And there's locations across the United States like Skinwalker Ranch, you know, Dulce, New Mexico, even, um, Yosemite, different areas of high strangeness all across the United States where they have Bigfoot reports, orbs of lights, poltergeist activity, and UFO stuff all happening in the same area. Like all, all three different disciplines, if you will, all happening in the same area. And it's like, you can't just be a Bigfoot person and ignore the, the cabinet door swinging open behind you. And you can't be a Bigfoot person and ignore the orange ball of light that seems to be intelligently controlled floating by and the alien spacecraft flying over. I don't see it, you know, I'm just here for Bigfoot. What I enjoy most about both cryptozoology and ufology, honestly, is the camaraderie. The people in those communities, I just so enjoy having conversations with them and working together. Um, with them. And I think that might come from the fact that often people, I think, see those of us who are interested in these fields as a little off. Um, maybe like we have disassociative, um, dissociative disorders or something, um, or that we're sad and uneducated. And that's really unfair. In fact, there's a lot of very smart people that are investigating these things. And we have a sense of humor about this stuff too. You know, we get it that, that we're discussing things that are like just totally out there, but that's okay. That's part of the fun of it as well. And I think that, you know, because you can be judged harshly for having these sort of interests that in a way it almost brings you together. It causes you to have some sort of uh, empathy for each other, a connection, a sense of belonging to a tribe that we will be there to support and um, defend each other. They are a community. They may be a diverse community. There may be some, let's not kid ourselves that there aren't some fairly crazy people involved in cryptozoology and in ufology. Let's not kid ourselves that there aren't some charlatans and fraudsters in, in both these communities. But essentially, most of the people are involved, whether they're witnesses or whether they're researchers, are sincere, dedicated individuals who are intrigued by a mystery and want to push the boundaries of human knowledge, and rightly so. I mean, that's, that's what being human and 
being intelligent should be about. Pushing those boundaries, asking those questions, trying to expand um, the, the sum of all human knowledge. And if that takes us into some difficult and uncomfortable territories, well, you know, that's how we maybe make big advances through adversity. I've had some people tell me, yeah, you know, you're welcome to use the story, but don't use my name. Others are like, yeah, you can use my name and address if you want to, and so other people can reach me. And now a lot of them are like, not only don't use it, please, please, please don't use it. And I don't, you know, people say don't use it. You know, I'm not in the business of outing people who don't want to be. And some of those stories of these really strange MIB hybrid guys in black suits and fedoras, it sounds really weird. So nobody wants to communicate. You know, investigating the paranormal, it's like the light on the hill that you're sort of looking out to. Um, it's not necessarily that that light is the answer, although maybe you will find the answer to the big questions, and I love asking the big questions, but it's the journey. And so going towards the light, meaning what is out there, what is in the distance, what's behind the veil that we don't quite see, but we, if we keep going that way, we'll get answers along the way. That's exciting because hopefully we do learn about ourselves. And I think, I think we do. I think we become more accepting and loving and tolerant people and forget tolerance, accepting people because we're, we're entering this weird world where anything seems to be possible. And my goodness, isn't it high stakes? At the moment, we have all our eggs in one basket here on planet Earth. One global pandemic, one big enough comet or asteroid strike, one nuclear war, and that's it. The human adventure ends where it began here on Earth. If we could acquire wisdom to overcome our problems, technology that will take humankind to the stars, then we will no longer have all our eggs in one basket and humanity can maybe colonize other worlds and spread and become more diverse and we can learn and exist and and really have an existence i mean someday even if even if nothing else happens going down the path and learning about other people and their experiences sort of opened me up to the experience which then allowed me to have the experience it makes it easier if you're sort of the, the can is sort of half open, then, you know, water can fly, get in and stuff can drip in and then you can start to uh, experience what, it, what that tastes like uh, as opposed to being sealed shut and you're not going to see anything. It's good not to open it too much and, you know, flood it with whatever and then you're, you know, your brains are leaking out of your head there. But, um, but that's okay too, you know, do that and then put them back in and, you know, patch it up. Um, but I definitely think... Uh, having an open mind and and venturing into this world and, and, and having these experiences and interactions is, is a key part of it. I think the UFO world, I think the paranormal world, the ghost hunters, they're really starting to open up to it too. And I think we're all kind of realizing that we're um, different chapters of the same book, so to speak. We're, we're different factions of the same, you know, organization more or less. And uh, that's really a good thing. But yeah, to answer your question, um, there is some pushback. There is a lot of the hardcore people, um, but you're starting to see less and less of it, which is a good thing. For all of you out there um, that, that love these topics, thank you. Thank you for, for doing what you do. Because I think that on the periphery, even though maybe we're the ones that um, are willing to put our faces out front and <laughs> publicly discuss these things on the periphery there are people that are watching and listening uh, maybe they're not posting on their facebook page you know latest article about cryptozoology but they might see our posts um, maybe they tune into radio shows and they never talk to anyone else about it outside of that they don't talk to people at work or family it's just kind of like their own little um you know mystical world that they created